Coming up on this episode, we're taking a look at some of the amazing books coming your way this month. Welcome to episode 307 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will Canals, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello, everybody. As always, this podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. If you'd like more information about the bonus content we offer our patrons, go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. We are so glad that you could join us for another episode of the show. And as we get started in this preview episode, it actually seemed like a good idea to talk about some things that we've been seeing in our own local bookstores lately. Now, it's always been the case that a lot of independent bookshops carry a nice selection of MM Romance. But lately here in our town, which is just outside of Sacramento in Northern California, we've been finding the bigger box stores carrying some wonderful selections of MM Romance and gay YA books as well. Our local Barnes & Noble, we have found books from Annabeth Albert, Cat Sebastian, even independently published titles such as some by Amy Aslan recently have shown up there. They always seem to carry the latest Karina Adores titles, and it's been really wonderful to see that representation there. Similarly, good representation has been happening over in the YA section as well, with authors like Adam Silvera, Becky Albertalli, and some of the newer YA titles that we've seen, including some wonderful ones by authors of color as well. So expanding representation in that story, and even this past week, which surprised me quite extensively, was finding Alexis Hall's boyfriend material in our Target as one of its featured selections. So really excited to see this expansion of MM Romance into stores like that. We certainly buy a book or two every time we find a title like that in the stores so that we show the store that there's community support for those titles. And we certainly encourage you to do the same if you can. Pick up those paperback titles when you see them in the big box stores. And hopefully we'll just continue to see that as the publishers continue to roll out these titles into the Romance and YA sections. Not only have we been shopping for books recently, but we've also been enjoying some feel-good television. First up, there's Bargain Block, which is a new house-flipping show on HGTV. It features partners Keith and Evan, who are going through some rundown areas of Detroit, picking up houses for as little as $1,000 through a program that's offered by the city, and then flipping them into some really amazing houses that help to reinvigorate these blocks, reinvigorate these neighborhoods, and give people a beautiful place to live. It's really amazing watching their couple's dynamic. Like, I can't imagine flipping a house by myself, much less with my husband, because I think we would drive each other crazy. But these two do it, and I would live in any of these houses that these guys have done because the design aesthetic is really, really something. Even as I look at it, as they're doing it, going, we're going to do this thing and these colors. And I'm like, really? And then it all turns out beautifully in the end. If you want to check out the work these two are doing, you can catch it on HGTV Wednesday nights at 9 Eastern. Something else we've been enjoying is a show over on Nickelodeon called The Barbarian and the Troll. I don't really know how well to describe this, other than the fact that the title is exactly what it's about. (laughs) It's Barbarian and a Troll. And they go off on quests together and do all kinds of really kooky and fun shenanigans. There's some great musical numbers that get thrown in here because the troll is essentially singing the exploits of the barbarian. It is ridiculously fun and has become something we look forward to each and every Friday. It's funny and it's irreverent. It skewers classic fantasy tropes. And it's got puppets. As Jeff said, we find the adventures of Evan the Troll and Brendar the Barbarian utterly hilarious. It's a comedy that I think all members of your family will enjoy. And if you want to check it out, it's on Nickelodeon Fridays at 7 and also available on the Nickelodeon app and Paramount+. Plus. You keep calling it Nickelodeon. That's not its name. Only, only people of our generation know what we're talking about. It's on the Nick channel. They don't call it Nickelodeon anymore. It's, it's only Nick? Nick. That's it. Oh my gosh. Well, there you go. Go to Nick and find it. Seven o'clock on Fridays. So the month of May is positively jam-packed with some amazing book releases. So many books that Jeff and I are looking forward to, and we thought we'd share some of them with you this week. Now, for those of you who didn't think Bridgerton was nearly gay enough, and truthfully it wasn't, boy, have we got a book for you. It's called A Husband for Hartwell by J.A. Rock and Lisa Henry. He must marry or risk his fortune. 
The whole of London society has long assumed Lord William Hartwell will marry his childhood best friend, Lady Rebecca Warrington. After two seasons, Hartwell remains quite content with his bachelorhood. His parents do not. When Hartwell learns they intend to cut his purse strings unless he makes a match this season, he resigns himself to a marriage of convenience with Becca. And yet, he can't help but be drawn to her younger brother, Worry. He must marry or risk his sister's ruin. The Viscount Warrington, Worry, is used to being viewed as the tag-along little brother. Now a grown man about to enter his second season, Worry is desperate to be seen. When Lord Balfour, a handsome older peer, takes Wary under his wing, Wary thinks his dream is finally coming true, until Balfour reveals its true intent, to make public a letter that will destroy Becca's reputation unless Wary agrees to marry him. Time is running out for both of them. When an injury forces Wary to recover at Hartwell House, the two succumb to a secret flirtation. But Wary's sudden announcement of his engagement to Balfour drives Hartwell near mad with jealousy and right into Becca's arms. With a clock ticking for Wary to save his sister, will Hartwell discover the truth of Wary's feelings before it's too late? You know, six months ago, I wouldn't have understood a lot of what you just read. The concept of the seasons and how worked up people could get about marriage and not being married and what goes on in all the society. But of course, I've now watched Bridgerton and I understand everything you just said. <laughs> and I could actually see that story playing out with Lady Whistledon reporting it over here somewhere, <laughs> adjacent to all of the other news. I kind of want to read that after my Bridgerton binge back over Christmas. And kudos to them for building on the on all the Bridgerton terminology that some of us may have learned back there in December, too. Yeah, I think this just sounds too damn delicious. I cannot wait to dig into this particular one. Lots of romance and secrets and behind-the-scenes social machinations. Ooh! So good. Another reason I'm definitely interested in reading this particular title is how the authors are exploring the idea of marriage between two men. This was something I also encountered in a story that I read during my 100-day challenge. There was a short story where our hero was being wooed by an older, inappropriate suitor. So the other hero had to swoop in and come to his rescue. And I'm not sure what to exactly call that, where the authors are exploring the gay romance tropes in a historical setting and not necessarily remaining true to the actual history of record, meaning, of course, that any men who had a relationship had to keep it secret. And I've certainly read many historicals where that is certainly the case, but coming across some of these newer titles, I think it's interesting where the relationships between the two main characters are simply a matter of everyday life. And we're taking the gay romance and putting it front and center as part of the social machinations that are so important to historical romance. I don't know if there's an actual term for this particular subgenre of gay historical romance. I think there needs to be so that readers who enjoy this particular exploration of romance in this time period can easily identify it and find their trope catnip much more easily. Because I'm certainly intrigued by it, and I'm definitely more than willing to dive into more books that explore the relationships in this way. So there's the challenge for everyone. Let's find a name to call this thing so it can be properly categorized in blurbs. That's A Husband for Hartwell, which is the first book in the Lords of Bucknell Club series by J.A. Rock and Lisa Henry, and that is headed our way May 11th. The next book I want to talk about is May the Best Man Win, in which a trans boy enters a throwdown battle for the title of Homecoming King with the boy he dumped last summer in Z.E. Eller's contemporary YA debut. Jeremy Harkis, cheer captain and student body president, won't let coming out as a transgender boy ruin his senior year. Instead of bowing to the bigots and outdated school administration, Jeremy decides to make some noise, and how better than by challenging his all-star ex-boyfriend, Lucas, for the title of Homecoming King. Lucas Rivers, football star and head of the Homecoming Committee, is just trying to find order in his life after his older brother's funeral and the loss of his long-term girlfriend, who turned out to be a boy. But when Jeremy threatens to break his heart and steal his crown, Lucas kickstarts a plot to sabotage Jeremy's campaign. When both boys take their rivalry too far, the dance is on the verge of being canceled. To save homecoming, they'll have to face the hurt they're both hiding and the lingering butterflies they can't deny. This title's been on my radar for a while, along with several other trans-focused YA books that are on the way this summer. 
These books are always important, but even more so now in the anti-trans culture that we're living in in the U.S. with so many state legislatures having bills on the table that target trans, especially trans youth. Uh, I think books like this are super important to get into people's hands. And this story, I think, sounds like a, a real winner. Yeah, I can't wait to give this one a try. I think it's a really interesting and intriguing twist on the lovers to enemies to lovers again trope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to give it a try. It's Made the Best Man Win by Z.R. Eller, and that's going to be releasing on May 18th. The next book I want to talk about is from best-selling author Stephen Rowley. And the tagline reads, it's a warm and deeply funny novel about a once famous gay sitcom star whose unexpected family tragedy leaves him with his niece and nephew for the summer. If that's not a sit up for a sitcom, I don't know what is. Exactly right. It's The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Patrick, or gay uncle Patrick, Gup for short, has always loved his niece Maisie and nephew Grant. That is, he loves spending time with them when they come out to Palm Springs for week-long visits or when he heads home to Connecticut for the holidays. But in terms of caretaking and relating to two children, no matter how adorable, Patrick is honestly overwhelmed. So when tragedy strikes and Maisie and Grant lose their mother, and Patrick's brother has a health crisis of his own, Patrick finds himself suddenly taking on the role of primary guardian. Despite having a set of gunkel rules ready to go, Patrick has no idea what to expect. Having spent years barely holding on after the loss of his great love, a somewhat stalled acting career, and a lifestyle not so suited to a six and nine-year-old, Patrick quickly realizes that parenting, even if temporary, isn't solved with treats and jokes. Patrick's eyes are open to a new sense of responsibility, and the realization that sometimes, even being larger than life, means you're unfailingly human. I'm looking forward to digging into this book. It sounds... Completely adorable, heartwarming. I mean, just kind of everything you would want in a nice summertime read. Throw in a couple of kids, you know, it's got all the setup of a book that I imagine will make me laugh and make me cry at the same time. Yeah, this gay anti-mame setup is just too delicious to resist. I can't wait to read this one either. It's called The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley, and it's coming out on May 25th. Their love story captivated the world, the crown prince, and that guy from New York. And that's the tagline for Playing the Palace, the new romantic comedy from author Paul Rudnick, whose name may or may not sound familiar to you. He is an essayist and playwright, best known for his play Jeffrey. He's also a well-respected screenwriter. He wrote Adam's Family Values and the movie In and Out. And in this new book, a lonely American event planner starts dating the gay prince of Wales, and a royal uproar ensues. Is it true love or the ultimate meme? Find out in this hilarious romantic comedy. Here's the blurb for playing the palace. After having his heart trampled on by his cheating ex, Carter Ogden is afraid love just isn't in the cards for him. He still holds out hope in a tiny corner of his heart, but even in his wildest dreams, he never thought he'd meet the crown prince of England, much less do a lot more with him. Yes, growing up, he'd fantasized about the handsome, openly gay Prince Edgar, but who hadn't? When they met by chance at an event Carter's boss is organizing, Carter's sure he imagined all that sizzling chemistry. Or was it mutual? This unlikely but meant-to-be romance sets off media fireworks on both sides of the Atlantic, with everyone having an opinion on their relationship and the intense pressure of being constantly in the spotlight. Carter finds ferocious obstacles to his happily ever after, including the tenacious disapproval of the Queen of England. Carter and Prince Edgar fight for a happy ending to equal their glorious international beginning. It's a match made on Valentine's Day and in tabloid heaven. Prince trope, Prince trope. Which you know is one of my very favorite things. I think it's going to be a battle to see which of us gets to this book first. (laughs) (laughs) Not to mention that it's Paul Rudnick. I mean, I love his previous books. I love his plays. I love his movies. It, it, it can't help but be a wonderful book, especially because Prince Trope, and hopefully it'll just become a movie as well, because I would be all over that. Oh, God, yeah, that would be amazing. Playing the Palace comes out on May 25th. Another title that we're each also looking forward to is Hard Sell by Hudson Lynn. And for these two characters, one night wasn't enough. Danny Ip walks into every boardroom with a plan. 
His plan for a struggling tech company, West Tech, is to acquire it, shut it down, and squeeze the last remaining revenue out of it for his Jade Harbor Capital portfolio. But he didn't expect his best friend's younger brother, the hottest one-night stand he ever had, to be there. Tobin Locke has always thought the world of Danny. He's funny, warm, attractive, and totally out of Tobin's league. Now pitted against Danny at work, Tobin might finally get a chance to prove he's more than just Wei's little brother. It takes a lot to get under Danny's skin, but Tobin is all grown up in a way Danny can't ignore. Now with a promising patent on the line and stakes higher than ever, all he can think about is getting Tobin back into his bed and into his life for good. Okay, number one, this cover. It's amazing. From the moment both of us saw it, we were like, hell yes. They are serving up high fashion executive realness. It is so hot. It's like a blend between Harlequin Presents and Dynasty. It is glamour. It is everything. I love this book cover. They are such the power couple on that book cover. You just know they sat for that portrait once they got to their happy ever after at the end. That's like the next thing that they did, probably. <laughs> it's such a good cover. As we open the month, I've read the beginning of the book, and it just starts off. These two pop on the page so much. Yeah, it's it's a good one. If best friend's younger brother is your trope catnip, then definitely check this one out. And make sure to join us on May 24th, because Hudson Lynn will be here talking about this book. And we don't only talk about Hard Sell, but we also talk about a couple of other amazing projects that she works on as well. So you don't want to miss that. Keep an eye out for Hard Sell. It is coming your way May 25th. And lastly, I'd like to close things out with another historical recommendation. It's called Just a Little Mischief by Mary Farmer. Valet Xavier Lawrence hasn't seen much of the world. So when his employer, the Duke of Selby, takes him along on a transatlantic voyage in pursuit of his missing son and heir, Xavier is thrilled with the opportunity. But the excitement over his first taste of salt air and the sea is nothing to the thrill of an opportunity for a secret affair. Dancer Alexander Plashenko is on his way to New York to see his family with no idea whether they will accept him or not after a slip at St. James Park ended with him spending time in jail for gross indecency. The last thing he needs with all that hanging over him is to meet the dashing and fresh-faced Xavier as soon as the ship leaves port. Falling in love is easy, but conducting a steamy affair on a crowded ship with few places to hide is another thing entirely. When more than just Xavier and Xander's reputations end up at stake, and with limited time together before the voyage ends, can the two men prevent a disaster and find a reason to stay together? I'm thinking they'll find a way to figure it out. I think they probably will. <laughs> and what a nice twist on forced proximity to stick them in a cruise ship, but also not be alone. I mean, they can't go many places, but they're also surrounded by people at the same time. Yeah, this is an intriguing setup, and I can't wait to see how our two heroes fall in love in this unique situation. I'd be willing to bet it's not as easy as sharing a cabin together. <laughs> <laughs> Just a Little Mischief by Mary Farmer is actually book nine in her Brotherhood series, and that will be releasing on May 28th. So while we're looking at May, let's drop back just a couple of days to a book that came out earlier this week, and that is Silent Night by Layla Rain. This is the book I've been waiting for since I began Layla's Fog City series. I've been captivated by Holt Madigan, the hacker member of the Madigan clan who often stays back at the base, making sure ops run smoothly and using his computer skills to help get things done. He's essentially the digital assassin in the family of assassins. He's also dad to an adorable baby girl, Lily, and has had his heart and trust stomped on multiple times and is referred to by his brother and sister as the heart of the family and the best of them. Holt finally gets his story in Silent Night, and it was worth the wait for this extraordinary conclusion to the Fog City series. Taking a departure from the other books, Silent Night starts off in the past, 14 years in the past, as 18-year-old Private Madigan steps off a plane in Afghanistan, one of many soldiers Captain Brax and Kane has to take through orientation on the base. Brax is immediately drawn to the big man, the most beautiful man he's ever seen, but who at the same time looks terrified. When sirens go off in the middle of the night, Brax finds out how scared Holt is when he finds the big man hiding under the bed instead of going where he's supposed to. Brax kindly helps Holt calm down, and that begins years of friendship that we see played out in several vignettes, 
some while they're serving together in Afghanistan, and then continuing as they return to the States and taking us through how Brax ended up in San Francisco and ultimately leading us into the present day. I love this look at how Holt and Brax met and how their relationship grew over the years. It brings a new richness to everything we've seen in Fog City so far, and we know exactly why these men would risk everything for each other. Once we're in the present, we find out why Brax has been keeping a distance from the Madigans. He's being targeted and he wants to keep the family safe, especially Holt, so he's trying not to let them help at all. Of course, that's not how the Madigans operate, and for sure, it isn't going to stop Holt from helping his best friend, who is also the man that he loves and means the world to him. Holt and Brax can both be stubborn when it comes to who is protecting who. It's endearing, sometimes frustrating, and totally wonderful. It's really mind-blowing who's pulling the strings in an effort to take down Brax. My mind spun many scenarios, but of course, I did not figure out the who, the how, or the why to any of it. As always, Layla builds quite the startling thriller. Beyond who's behind all of it, though, it's the stunning coming together of the family and so many members of the extended Whiskeyverse, too, as characters we know and love from Agents Irish and Whiskey and Trouble Brewing make appearances. Despite the Madigans being a family of assassins, they forge some incredible alliances. None are stronger than that of family, and the support that Hawes and Helena give to their brother wasn't really surprising given the importance of family to them, but it still made an indelible impression and only heightened the emotions and power of the story. I have to say, it was wonderful to see Holt finally get angry and to put an end to the conflict once and for all. It's a stunning scene in the finale. While I'm sad that the Fog City series is done, I could not be more happy with how it ended. And it's one heck of a love story for my favorite characters in the series. I really can't emphasize how wonderful I found the flashbacks. I know flashbacks are always kind of a tenuous thing for some people, but I think because the story is really told in a linear fashion going into the past and then coming up to the present and going forward, it really makes for a continuous story that gives us critical backstory on how Brax and Holt met, how their friendship grew, and how the love grew to be as strong as it is. Just really delightful and such a satisfying read. And of course, Layla's never really completely done with characters. She's actually going to join us next week on Thursday, May 13th in episode 309 to talk about the end of this series and also some of the awesome things she's got planned coming up next. Definitely something to look forward to there. Well, this past week, I read an older title by Avril Ashton. It was called Temple, and it is the first book in her Freelancers series. So at the beginning of the book, Temple still feels the pain and guilt of the night his best friend was killed on the job that went sideways. Henry was the closest thing to a brother Temple ever had. They grew up in a group home together and later worked with a group of mercenaries taking jobs that no one else would. You see, it was Temple who convinced Henry to take this one last job. And it was Temple who had to tell Henry's inconsolable fiance Vic, that Henry was never coming back. We flash forward two years later, and Temple finds himself back in town during the holidays. And it's by chance that he gets coffee at the shop that Vic owns. They finally have the chance to clear the air, and Vic apologizes for the accusations he made that night. He wants him to know that he doesn't hold Temple responsible for Henry's death. And after a few days, they both reach a comfortable place together, a new kind of normal. But now Temple has something else to feel guilty about, his desire for Vic. One night, he invites Vic over for pizza and a few beers, and they settle in on the couch and watch a Christmas movie, and they explore their feelings with a scorchingly hot kiss, like so hot. And since it's late and it's snowing out, Vic decides to spend the night but ends up sleeping in Temple's bed alone. You see, their attraction is undeniable, but so are their feelings of betraying the man that meant so much to the both of them. To answer the question whether they should or should not be together, Temple goes to see Vic and hash out just what exactly it is each of them wants, and of course, what each of them wants is the other. So Temple is able to temporarily set aside his guilt and unleash his intense primal need for Vic. They end up having sex on the kitchen counter and then later on the couch. It's like, oh my God, it's so bonkers hot. And after their remarkable night, Vic knows he wants more, but he's worried about the radio silence from Temple. I mean, does he not feel the same way? The thing is, he most definitely does, but he's still grappling what he and Vic being together would mean. 
It's then that a former colleague offers him a job opportunity. Walking away from Vic would mean he wouldn't have to deal with all the pain in his past. When Temple tells Vic about the job, Vic begs him not to leave, something he wishes he'd done with Henry in a nearly identical situation two years earlier. But Vic doesn't need to worry, though Temple said no. You see, Henry wouldn't want them to remain unhappy, and staying miserable is no way to honor his memory. They visit Henry's gravesite on Christmas Eve, secure in the knowledge that their future is with each other. And for the first time in a very long time, Temple and Vic have something to look forward to. Now, normally I would say that ending a romance with a visit to the cemetery doesn't exactly scream happily ever after, but for these two characters, it makes perfect sense. Vic and Temple share the traumatic loss of someone who was a really important part of their lives. And ending the story in this way, while there is still grief, because it's something that you just simply can't, you know, you can't get over it. It shows that they're moving forward and starting to live life fully once again. I want to give kudos to author Avril Ashton for writing such a deeply emotional romance that explores the themes of grief and guilt without veering into like really heavy and dark melodrama. I mean, you all know I'm not a fan of angsty romances. And what I thought was so great about this story is that it honestly deals with the pain these characters feel, but it doesn't dwell on it. It's not trauma porn. And plus it's helped that Temple and Vic aren't the woe is me type. They work really hard to figure out the emotionally complicated situation that they find themselves in. Their HEA is hard fought and it's well deserved. And also their sexual chemistry happens to be off the charts. Seriously, the love scenes are crazy scorching hot. So if you happen to be looking for a story with lots of heat that doesn't scrimp on the emotion, I think this is definitely going to be the romance for you. It's the book that kicks off her freelancer series. That's Temple by Avril Ashton. That sounds really quite delightful. Even though it does have that element of grief in it, it sounds like those two really came together nicely. Yeah, Avril Ashton is kind of known for her dark romances dealing with really hard, difficult subjects that the characters have to work through. Stories that are generally pretty angst-heavy. And this story, from what I understand from this particular author, is her light and fluffy romance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is, you know, why I enjoyed it so much. Like I said, it's it's got realness. It's got sexiness. It's kind of the whole package. I really, really loved it. Fantastic. Well, I took a turn into a different genre for myself with Anna Zabo's Cinnamon Roll. It's really one of the sweetest, most romantic books I've read. We talk a lot on the show that we really love nice guys doing nice things. And Max and Tom are very much those guys. This is my first book with BDSM at the forefront. And it really completely changed my preconceived notions about what a BDSM book could be. And if this is what they are, sign me up for more. (laughs) Anna wrote two sweet, caring, albeit somewhat broken people and brought them together in such a beautiful way that I was sad to see this book end. Cinnamon Roll is one of the books in the Bold Brew series. And this one is the story of Tom, who really, really sucks at finding men. The doms he's connected with in the past don't respect his boundaries and don't really care for him. While the sex and the pain are good in the moment, it's not offering him the fulfillment that he really wants and needs. He knows he's missing something, but he's not quite sure what that is. Then there's Max, a dom who does occasional demonstrations at Bold Brew. Now, as this book opens... He finds the ad that Tom has posted at Bold Brew looking for a dom, and then he watches the quite painful string of interviews that Tom goes through as he meets people who are responding to the ad. While Max and Tom have been in the same circles for quite some time, neither has approached the other, and that finally changes as the two talk at the coffee shop about why Tom's ad isn't going to attract the right person. It's an interesting conversation that, in relatively short order, not only begins a friendship, but also finds Tom helping Max do a demo at Bold Brew. From the beginning, as Max walks Tom through the planned demo and works to understand what Tom's likes and dislikes are, we have the beginning of one of my very favorite romance things, talking. These guys talk a lot, and it's absolutely freaking awesome. Consent is a huge part of their discussions, and not just around the BDSM aspects of things. Plus, it's also not one-sided. It's all about Tom laying out what he does and doesn't want. And Tom asks just as many questions to Max because he wants to make sure Max is getting what he needs too. 
And it goes beyond what they're doing in the BDSM area. It goes into what they want with relationships. It goes right down to what do they want for dinner. It's really wonderful. And what surprises both guys is the attraction they feel for one another. And it goes beyond the sex and pain and beyond the friendship that they're building and even beyond being dom and sub. It moves slowly but surely into love. It even seems to sneak up on them as they're both not really sure what to do with it or even how it fits into their lives as they currently know them. Now their dates are so delightful and it gives even more insight to who they are. From going to dinner at various locations, including some really nice dinners at Max's home where he's cooking, and there's also a very swanky place that they get to go to that really shows even more how wonderful Max is. They go to beer league hockey games because Max is a hockey player. They go skating together at a local rink. It was perfect. And guess what made these things even more perfect? There was a lot of talking going on. <laughs> I can't overemphasize how much I love that. Now, some of the talking to actually belong to their friends. Max has many friends and colleagues that he works with at the local university. And a few of them had some pretty strong opinions on the burgeoning relationship between the guys. Tom's friend and law firm partner also weighed in often on how good Max was for him. Plus, there's the gang at Bold Brew who also cheered them on. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the sex in the book. I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it was damn hot. <laughs> While pain isn't my thing, it's very much Tom's, and Max very much likes inflicting it. However, they only enjoy it if their partner's actually enjoying it, too. The constant looking after each other, which is something that Tom really hadn't had with his other partners, and carrying through the pain, took those sex scenes to another level. It did exactly what sex is supposed to do in a romance, which is heighten the intimacy and the connection between the characters. So I'm very glad I picked up Cinnamon Roll. Not only did it open me up to a genre that I hadn't fully explored before, but it also showed me exactly how sexy and hot it can be. And it's got two characters with Tom and Max who are wonderful and kind and going after exactly what they want. I really can't recommend this book enough. And if you missed it, you can catch the wonderful conversation I had with Anna about it back in episode 303. A worthy addition to the Bold Brew universe of books. A quick reminder that this episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read our conversation and book reviews for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And as always, the show notes page also has links to everything that we talked about in this episode. The show notes will also include links to Libro.fm for the audiobooks that are available there. As always, we love Libro.fm because when you buy an audiobook from them, you're also supporting a local bookstore of your choice. Listeners to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast have the opportunity to take advantage of a two-month audiobook membership for the price of one. All you have to do to get information on that is go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash Libro.fm. That's L-I-B-R-O-F-M. All right, I think that'll do it for this episode. Now, coming up on Monday in episode 308, J.C. Calciano is going to be joining us and talking about his latest book, Revenge of the Brobot. They should get you to do the title on the audiobook for that, with that kind of voice. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great talking with J.C. about this wonderful rom-com with a futuristic edge. And we also talk about some of his movies and his brand new podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, stay strong. Be safe. And above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Our original theme music is composed by Daryl Banner. Daryl Banner.